Hey, howdy everyone. I'm Michael Perch. I'm a professor at the University of Texas at Austin and I record all my lectures on data analytics, geostatistics, and machine learning. So continuing on in our machine learning course, in the last lecture I tried to motivate this idea that we need advanced clustering methodologies for many natural settings. We need to go beyond the k-means clustering with its assumptions of spherical patterns and convex subsets and so forth. And so let's go ahead and get into a very flexible heuristic approach for clustering, a density-based clustering approach. Okay, the method that we're going to cover is known as dbscan. Now, dbscan stands for density-based spatial clustering of applications with noise. Now, the advantage is that it's actually not too hard to use. We can, in a reasonable manner, estimate the best hyperparameters to be able to build our models, and it can work with arbitrary shapes of clustering. It doesn't have that spherical assumption or anything like that, and it can be very efficient on large data sets. Okay, it is a hierarchical bottom-up agglomerative clustering methodology, all data samples start as their own. They're all unvisited, alone, and you then group things up. That's how it's going to work. We're going to assume, like we did before, k-means clustering, mutually exclusive groups. In other words, for the clusters i and j, if i is not equal to j, the probability of them being um, intersecting with each other is zero. In other words, they can Every data value can only belong to one group. But the difference is, whereas k-means clustering was exhaustive, the dbscan methodology is non-exhaustive. Some samples may be left remaining unassigned and deemed to be outliers, which is super epic. Not only do you get your automatic categories, but you can have the chance to deem or determine if some of the data samples are just outliers, which is really cool. So the probability of the union of all of the categories is going to be less than or equal to one, one if we turn out to be exhaustive and we have no outliers. General comments around it. Now, if I'm talking about density, what does density mean? Well, if you think about it, you have to think about what's the scale, and then you have to think, well, how dense? And so those are the hyperparameters here. The scale is a radius. How far are we going to investigate around a given sample as we iterate through? Super easy. And this is interesting. It's, it's going to be tied to the concept of the scale of the clusters. Too small, too many samples are going to be left out as outliers and too large the clusters will all merge together. Everything will seem connected. But we also have this concept of not only the scale, but we're also concerned about how many points does it take to really be dense, right? We have to choose a minimum number of points to be able to say that this will be what we'll call later on core, but we'll talk more about it. But whether or not we should initialize a cluster and start to grow it hierarchically bottom up. Okay, now I mentioned before that there is some intuition or some numerics we can use to get at pretty good parameters. That radius can be a little bit tricky, it could seem, but there is a methodology widely used which is based on the k-distance graph. Now, not a problem. Uh, k equals 1 would just be simply going to every data point and calculating the distance to the nearest data point. That would be the k equals 1 case of k-distance. You calculate that and you can go ahead and take those distances and sort them in ascending order. You would have the number of data, which in this case is 1700 data, cases of distances to the nearest neighbor. And you could look at this plot and it will have this shape. The point of maximum curvature, someone like right here, would be a what we call the elbow of the plot and usually a good estimate of our radius that we should use for this DB scan. Now, if you think about what does it mean, it means that all of those data up until we got to this distance were kind of all grouped together. They, this elbow is really telling about where you reach a point of greater sparsity, where you'll have fewer data with greater, greater distances apart from each other. If you think about that conceptually, that would be telling you about the size of clusters. Okay, and so that's 
how we interpret this. And so let's go ahead and do DB scan by hand or by slide. And I work this out in slides. This is gonna be a multimedia extravaganza in fact. Let's go ahead and we'll take this data set, feature one, feature two. It's a nice two dimensional setting, super easy to look at. Usually it's higher dimension, right? Let's assume a minimum number of samples of four in order to say, oh, this looks like we should grow a cluster here. And the radius will be this scale right here, which you'll see the circle stays the same size on all my plots. What we're gonna do is we initialize all of the data as unvisited. Everybody's just a white filled point. In other words, unvisited, haven't gone there. Okay, then we're going to go ahead and we'll visit the very first data value randomly. Now, so I was lazy, I should have made a slide with all white points and then show this first point, but just imagine that happened. We've gone to our first point right here. We put the circle down with the radius. We look around and we count the number of points and when we count, we get one. One, that's it. We don't have any other points around us whatsoever. That we did not meet our minimum number samples criteria of four, and we are gonna determine that that point now visited has been declared to be an outlier. Dun, 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 that's it. Okay, so now we go ahead and we proceed randomly to the next location. Now, when we put the circle down, we get one, two, three, four, five. Woohoo, we're above the four point threshold. And so we will deem that point to be core. We are seeding a cluster and we're gonna grow, right? We have to grow around that. Okay, so we've gone ahead. Now we're gonna focus there. Now the workflow is going to say, let's look at all of these points and determine if they are core points too. And we do that. This point, this point, this point. If you look at their circles, they have enough points. It's only this point right here that does not meet the minimum threshold, but it is within the region of a core point. It is deemed to be a boundary point. Okay, so now what do we have to do? Well, we've determined we have these new core points. We have to visit all of the data points within their neighbors and determine if they're also core points. So let's do that. We add this point and this point, their core points. And now, yeah, and you can see they have four points in their neighborhoods. And now we have to visit the points in their neighborhoods. So if you look here, what's happened is we have investigated and found that these points are boundary points. This is a boundary point right here. And we have a core point right here. So now we have to investigate that point. We investigate that point and now it's a boundary point. We're stuck. No new core points, we're not growing, we can stop now. So now what we do is we're going to go pick another random location. So we go right back to the beginning, pick a random location. Okay, count the number of points in that neighborhood, one, it's an outlier, okay? Now we go to another random location. Oh, we got four points now, that's good news. Core point, okay, now we gotta go to work. We got a core point, we're gonna start working around that core point. We got three points around it, we're gonna investigate them. This point is core, these points are boundary. Okay, now we got a, a new core point. We gotta look at its neighborhood and we look around it. Oh, another core point, we're on a roll. So now we gotta investigate those two points and uh, eh, they're boundary points. They don't have enough neighbors, we're done growing. Okay, so now we can go ahead and visit another random location. Not enough points, outlier. Another random location, not enough points, outlier and another random location right here, and we're done, we'll finish up. So we got a bunch of outliers, we got core points, we got boundary points, we got outliers. Okay, so uh, how are we gonna get our clusters? Because all we've done is we've categorized our data, outlier, core point, and boundary. So let's define some concepts here. We've got directly density reachable. What does that mean? Well, we can say sample alpha is directly density reachable from beta if beta is a core point and alpha is in its region. Okay, so these ones are all reachable from this location right here. So far, so good. Now we have the idea of density reachable. With density reachable, what we'll say is alpha is density reachable from beta if beta is a core point, but we can traverse through a chain of core points all within each other's radius we can we can we can go along a chain and we can get 
to our alpha right there. So beta, alpha, and we can say that alpha is density reachable from beta. Okay, cool. We're kind of getting the sense of connection and we're seeing chains of connection. Let's go one step further. Density connected is if we have a row point which can be density reachable by both. So if we have alpha and beta, if we have a common point that's with, shared within their regions along their chains, we'll connect them up. Now, what we have is the ability to connect everything up based on this idea of density connected and all of the density reachable and directly density reachable within the regions and we can connect things up. So anytime we have anything density connected, a cluster will be deemed to be a category. Okay, we'll sign the same category across them. And so if we go to our original data set and we looked at those cores and boundaries and outliers, we would get this cluster two, cluster one, and all of the gray points remain as outliers. Now, I hope I got all the colors of the points right. Let me know if I've messed any of this up. We can say that this method is very powerful. There's no need for a prior assignment of the number of categories. That's kind of cool. It learns it from the data, from the densities and from their groupings. And we can go ahead and build a very flexible methodology. It can work with non-convex data, variable densities within the groups, and as in frequencies can change within the groups and it won't be overly sensitive like we saw with the k-means clustering. If you're interested to try out dbscan, I have a very well-documented workflow in a Jupyter notebook in Python on my GitHub repository. And you can go ahead and check this out, try it out. Now, I'm gonna end right there. And then next time, next lecture, I'll talk about spectral clustering, which is super cool, really neat stuff. All right, I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin. I share all of my lectures online to try to support my students with evergreen content. If you're interested in research in data analytics, geostatistics, machine learning, you work for a company and you think it'd be great to partner together to solve problems, I have great PhD students. We're interested in doing great applied and theoretical research, and we're always happy to discuss and collaborate. All right, everybody, stay safe.